We enter the Polar Gulf. How the Polar King penetrated what appeared to be an insurmountable obstacle, and the joyful proof that the hills did not belong to a polar continent, but were a continuous congregation of icebergs frozen in one solid mass, are already known to the reader. The gallant ship continued to make rapid progress toward the open water lying ahead of us. Midday found us in 84 degrees 10 minutes north latitude and 150 degrees west longitude. The sun remained in the sky as usual to add his splendour to our day of deliverance and exultation. What we felt was to be wholly cut off from the outer world. The chances were that the passage in the ice would be frozen up solid again soon after we'd passed through it. Even with our dogs and sledges the chances were against our retreat southward. The throbbing of the engine was the only sound that broke the stillness of the silent sea. The laugh of the sailors sounded hollow and strange, and seemed a reminder that with all our freedom we were prisoners of the ice, sailing where no ship had ever sailed, nor human eye gazed on such a sea of terror and beauty. Happily, we were not the only beings that peopled the solitudes of the Pole. Flocks of gulls, geese, ptarmigan, and other arctic fowls wheeled around us. They seemed almost human in their movements, and were the links that bound us to the beating hearts far enough off then to be regretted by us. Every man on board the vessel was absorbed in thought concerning our strange position. The beyond? That was the momentous question that lay like a load on every soul. While thinking of these things, Professor Starbottle inquired if, with such open water as we sailed in, how soon I expected to reach the pole. Well, said I, we ought to be at the 85th parallel by this time. Five more degrees or 300 miles will reach it. The Polar King will cover that distance easily in 24 hours. It is now 6 p.m. At 2 p.m. tomorrow, the 12th of May, we will reach the Pole. Professor Starbottle shook his head depreciatingly. I'm afraid, Commander, said he, we will never reach the Pole. His look, his voice, his manner filled me with the idea that something dreadful was going to happen. My lips grew dry with a sudden excitement as I hastily inquired why he felt so sure we would never reach the object of our search. What time is it, Commander, said he. I pulled forth my chronometer. It was just six o'clock. Well then, said he, look at the sun. The sun has swung around to the west, but hasn't fallen any. I looked at the sun, which, sure enough, stood as high as at midday. I was paralysed with a nameless dread. I stood rooted to the deck in anticipation of some dreadful horror. Good heavens, I gasped. What do you mean? I mean, said he, the sun is not going to fall again on this course. It is we who are going to fall. The, the sun will fall to its usual position at midnight, I stammered. Wait, wait till midnight. The sun won't fall at midnight, said the professor. I'm afraid to tell you why, he added. In God's name, I shouted, tell me the meaning of this. I will never forget the feeling that crazed me as the professor said, I fear, Commander, we are falling into the interior of the earth. You're mad, sir, I shouted. It cannot be. We're sailing to the North Pole. Wait till midnight, Commander, said he shaking my hand. I took his hand and echoed his words. Wait till midnight. After a pause, I inquired if he had mentioned his extraordinary fears to anyone else. Not a soul, he replied. Then, said I, say nothing to anybody until midnight. Aye, aye, sir, said he, and disappeared. The sailors evidently expected that something was going to happen on account of the sun standing still in the heavens, they were gathered in groups on deck discussing the situation with bated breath. I noticed them looking at me with wild eyes like sheep cornered for execution. The officers avoided calling my attention to the unusual sight, possibly divining I was already fully excited by it. Never was midnight looked for so eagerly by any mortal on earth as I awaited the dreadful hour that would either confirm or dispel my fears. Midnight came and the sun had not fallen in the sky. There he stood, as high as at noonday, at least five degrees higher than his position 24 hours before. Professor Starbottle, approaching me, said, Commander, my prognostication was correct. You see the sun's elevation is unchanged since midday. Now, one of two things has happened. Either the axis of the Earth has approached five degrees nearer the plane of its orbit since midday, or we are sailing down into a subterranean gulf. That the former is impossible midday today will disprove. If my theory of a subterranean sea is correct, the sun will fall below the horizon at midday, and our only light will be the earth light of the opposite mouth of the gulf into which we are rapidly sinking. 
Professor, said I, tell the officers and the scientific staff to meet me at once in the cabin. This is a tremendous crisis. Here I could leave the deck. Captain, officers, doctor, naturalist, Professor Rackine and many of the crew surrounded me, all in a state of the greatest consternation. End of chapter 5